Welcome to Next in Tech, an S&P Global Market Intelligence podcast where the world of emerging tech lives. I'm your host, Eric Anselman, Principal Research Analyst for the 451 Research Arm of S&P Global Market Intelligence. And today, we're going to be discussing consumer perspectives on ESG, environmental, social, and governance issues, with returning guest Cheryl Kingstone, the head of our customer experience and commerce team. Uh, Cheryl, welcome back to the podcast. Welcome back. I always love these discussions. Well, and this sounds like ones that are, are particularly timely. Uh, this is a report that is hot off the presses. And actually, I think is this really interesting extension. You know, we talked last about customer experience and digitization and sort of got down into the weeds, the, the technology pieces. Uh, but this is data that's really looking at consumer perspectives about an area that I think we've all focused on, uh, ESG aspects. And, and there's just some really interesting data that, that the report digs into. So, uh, Gil, why don't we get, dig into it ourselves? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So let's just talk about this. When we talk about ESG and we look at it from the consumer perspective, you know, let's not forget that we can't say ESG, right? It's a lot more complex than that. Things that are really driving attitudes towards ESGs that we probed in that has to do with things like, Privacy and data protection, very hot issue for both businesses and consumers, right? Now let's take a look at other things like energy efficiency and, and reducing carbon footprint. All of the E that have captured the attention and have boycotted everything from, you know, where we're going with carbon and energy efficiency to the attitudes towards climate. And so that's where those come into play. But we also have other areas that are interestingly lower in priority as it shouldn't be, right? So top of mind across the stack is things like health, safety, labor standards, which is important, especially in the age of COVID. So that has gotten up this area. Fair wages and benefits as we're talking about skilled workforces and employees and where that's going, absolutely top of mind. Understanding some elements here, What's lower on the list, surprisingly, has to do with, and it's really not that low, but it's lower compared to everything else, things like human rights and racial justice and workplace diversity. Those are falling a little bit lower on the list than I would say the privacy, data protection, energy, and health and safety. And I really just think is when you're stack ranking some of these, you've got to understand where the Maslow's hierarchy of needs are coming in <laughs> and how it truly impacts themselves directly. It all comes back to that personal perspective. Although it's yes. interesting that you know there there are these concerns about those aspects that are just a little bit outside of self. Uh, you know the the fair pay kinds of pieces. Although I guess you know most people consider you know their own pay, and maybe that reflects back into their concerns there as well. Yeah, so fair wages and benefits is absolutely crucial, and it's actually probably escalated. So I bet you in 2022, when we refield that, it's going to grow in priority of importance. And the other thing you have to look at is this is normalized across a consumer population representative. So bringing it down are the older generation, the 55 and plus, and where that's trying to go. The ones that are really prioritizing the fair wages angle is the ones that are really in the middle of their career, not the early, early ones, but the 25 to 44. They find that very, very important. Um, and so that's just an interesting aspect from that standpoint. There is a very different take across the board for all of these elements um, when it comes to the differences in generations. And workplace diversity, for example, really low on the priority aspect of the older generation, but much higher for, I would say, the 25 to 44. So if we're talking you know, millennials are really putting this uh, front and center, along with some of the health and safety. When we look at energy efficiency, that becomes more normalized. You know, everyone is really focused on the climate and where we're trying to do. And, and so those pretty much wind up being a lot closer in consistency across age groups. Wow. Well, how about the one that's near and dear to my heart when I'm wearing my security hat? Uh, data privacy. Uh, do you get that same kind of variability or, or was that consistent? 
we do get that same variability. And so when you do look at things like trust and privacy, the older generation actually is the one that really talks about it as extremely important. So I'm talking massive differences here. So when we look at generations, Gen Z, only 33% of privacy and data protections put it as very important. Now, if you look at the greatest generation and the baby boomers, you know, look at that, 57%, much higher, right? So it's really interesting, almost double of much of a priority when you're older versus the ones that are just pre-caring. Okay, boomer. Yep. Well, well, well. What I was going to dig into was one thing that you mentioned alongside data privacy was trust. Yeah, um, very good question to bring up, right? Because the other thing that we look at that's different than the ESG. This is something we track quarter over quarter. Has to do with the level of trust that consumers are having with U.S. businesses. That has to do with like honesty, reliability. Um, fair trade, that angle. And so over time, we see that majority of U.S. consumers are actually becoming less trusting of businesses, right? So even taking a look at the differences between um, a year ago, 2021 Q2 versus today, only 14% of individuals are less or more trusting of businesses today as compared to 22% are less trusting. Now, granted, there's not a lot of change in the middle, but the trust factor is significantly eroding in this day and age. And I think it's a combination of a couple of things. One, education factor of understanding the role of trust and privacy. Two, some major issues about data breaches, that are out there. And then if we really think about where we are today with cybersecurity and all of the negativity that's out there and the data breaches that we're having, a lot of consumers are very nervous about making sure their digital identities are really protected in the age of these digital experiences of where they are today. That's a really interesting point, especially when when used in that combination. Because you know, I know on the security side, uh, we've always wondered, when do we get to a point at which businesses are going to be punished for breaches? It seems that time and again, you know, breaches happen uh, and there are minor blips in business, but that uh, it, it doesn't seem to make, you know, other than a few handful of, of really uh, egregious cases, that, that it doesn't seem to really impact business all that much. But it sounds like maybe just this accumulation is is starting to raise a level of awareness that consumers are now really starting to see that this is an important aspect. They understand the implications, which I think may have been some of the problems originally. If you just get a new credit card, how bad can it be? But now when identities are compromised and more of your life is digital, maybe that's starting to to sink in a bit that that those impacts actually do have a, a much greater drive in terms of consumer behavior. Yeah, it does. And if we really look at it from the point of view of brand lovers, right? So 80% of brand lovers are really saying that a company's privacy and data protection is actually influencing their loyalty and influencing their behavior. So once we start seeing that this is impacting that top line, impact and everyone is trying to get at that brand advocacy, if you break that trust, all that effort and all those marketing campaigns and all those corporate communications that you've really invested in is going to go out the door. And so we really do have to understand how we're dealing with trust and privacy. And this is where a lot of my energy comes in, in my customer experience and commerce research. Because when we look at a lot of the data and the technology investments for improving CX, and it really does start with where businesses are focusing on for digital transformation, right? So when you tie it to digital transformation and you tie it towards trust and privacy and the correlation there, and the fact that we are really looking to be much more around a data-driven experience economy, That's where we're going to start really seeing businesses take it seriously. We're going to prioritize data governance. We're going to make sure that we have consent-based marketing really nailed properly. We have to really empower the businesses to understand, to really start tracking what is consented data and what is not. 
Well, and I will get a plug in for our earlier episode, uh, as well as the report that covers all of this, which has some great data about the technology aspects. And, and you know, I'll reiterate this piece that I think that we've been talking with, with our clients sort of very broadly about, which is the idea that, uh, that you'd pointed out, that you really, those digitally driven customers are really motivated and in fact are willing to pay a premium for the technology that helps drive the experience. And now we're getting to the actual customer preference pieces, that more emotional cons consumption driver. Uh, and and it get, this gets borne out again. You know, your most ardent fans are the ones for, you know, that you really need to be able to dedicate uh, yourselves to in terms of improving their experience to ensure that they stay that way. Right, absolutely, because we do see that digitally driven organizations are making much more strategic investments in things like privacy and data governance, in ways to use technology that's reducing friction at point of interaction in a safe and secure way, and also making sure that they're actually putting the right tools and technologies in place to manage those customer preferences. Now, there's another piece about the report that I think is also important to draw out is that you know, you're talking about ensuring that digital leaders are making those investments. But this is also something that, that customers need to know that that's happened as well. And, and that was something that, that you'd found that there, there seemed to be some gaps there. When we look at the difference between importance towards consumers when choosing a brand versus like merchants or brands making these investments, yes, they're investing in privacy and data protection. But they're not really understanding the role that that correlates maybe to their ESG. And yes, we're looking at things like energy efficiency and health and labor standards. But what we're seeing for things like workplace diversity, I don't think is getting the attention that it should across the board. So even consumers are not looking at workplace diversity when choosing a brand, right? It became low. But if you really look at the marketing campaigns and the strides that we've come today in just the ability to promote diversity has changed tremendously. So while it's not maybe a workplace diversity angle, the diversity angle within the customer experience side has dramatically changed over the years. How many times do we now see a broader representation in all the marketing campaigns and a lot of the experiences that we're seeing from the content that's being shown us? Or how are we also showing the fact that we don't only have skinny minis out there? you know, model centric, 100, you know, 510 women that weigh 100 pounds, right? We're showing all bodies, all representations, all flavors, whether they're biracial or equity, you know, it's just the way this really has to play out is that it isn't about the workplace diversity, it's about diversity in general. And I think that's really where we have to then probe a little bit more to understand why workplace diversity fell down when we know for a fact diversity in itself has increased tremendously in priority. So that's a good point. And I wonder whether or not that's something where, uh, you know, there's a perception that, that there is already a lot of work underway. But again, to your point, I guess something that, that certainly needs a lot more focus uh, when, when we're digging into a lot of this data from the next generation of the study. Yeah, let me just um, dive a little bit further into that. So one other angle that came out in this report that I do want to point out and why we think it might be table space takes today with respect to diversity and inclusion. But what we have seen is a boost in conversion and loyalty, right? So while we're very aware that this is changing and brands have made these investments, when we look at it from the point of view of the consumer, they are more likely to purchase from a brand or a business they feel demonstrates inclusivity in their advertising. So 56 to totally agree from that standpoint. And then they would spend more money with the brand if those proceeds went to more organizations that um, supported social justice and diversity and, and includes donations. So that's one aspect that we do see success in and in dollarizing the top line. Loyalty, right? So 57% will increase their loyalty if a brand is really showing more 
um, financially supporting diversity and inclusion. And then lastly, if they're diverse to hiring and training and investment, 63%. So we do have the one click down as it relates to the impact, but that's from the consumer standpoint, right? So we do have to understand where the spend is. Now that we see that it's impacting conversion and loyalty, what are businesses doing to capitalize on this? Got it. But it gets back to your original point. There's got to be visibility for it, you know, whether or not it's adding in contribution capabilities as part of the purchase process. You know, they've got to be able to get to that next stage. Uh, but that gets back to a focus on needing to have the technology in place to actually get that done, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's not just a one and done technology. You need to have the right data platform to make sure because we have to we have to understand all the different personas that are valuing and can really be converted based on diversity and inclusion. And it is at everyone. I go back to some of the uh, personas that I went earlier in the different generations. So we do need to understand the right data that's going to drive it. Then we need more of the technologies that are around personalization, the ability to target emails the right way, the ability to personalize in a privacy-centric way. All of these are going to be strong investments in more modern digital platforms that we can react more um, intently in real time based on past purchases, but also to make sure that we do have that identity of the person we're speaking to that really understands from their perspective what they want to see. Yeah, I mean, there's a very narrow line between caring and creepy in terms of that, what that engagement looks like and what that interaction is. And you've got to have a platform that gives you the capabilities to be able to manage that in with the care that's needed. Absolutely. So what do you think businesses should be looking at? I mean, we talked about some of the technology pieces, but from, from an ESG angle, where do you think businesses need to put focus and, and additional emphasis in terms of uh, addressing a, a lot of these consumer concerns? Yeah, it's complicated, right? So we do have this entire digital maturity model, right? And I would say ESG is, should be part of that. So where are we with the processes? How do we make sure that the processes that we're using are actually um, following through with our ESG commitments, right? So that's one. Now let's take another layer up with my digital maturity and we look at where we're going with things like the data and the content in the cloud. Again, that's where I was saying we have to make sure that we have more of a trusted view and a single source of the truth for our customers to make sure that we're able to uh, deliver on that trust. Um, and then when we look at things like advertising and marketing and platforms from that standpoint, helping businesses capture and understand and identify the right moment at the right time to promote these relevant social causes, really make sure that we're nurturing those moments across the customer journey. While that requires better process automation that relies on data and also machine learning algorithms that need to make investments to make sure that those algorithms are actually accurate. That's one of those things that we've just talked about some of the how do you prove out uh, you know, the lack of bias in, in AI and ML. Uh, those are big concerns. And, and the provable AI kinds of aspects of that play a big role there. I, I'm wondering you know, in terms of, I was just thinking about reestablishing you know, uh, some of this visibility, letting consumers know more about sort of ESG perspectives and oh, how that fares in light of the, the idea that consumers are saying that they're trusting businesses less. It seems like businesses have got to get over that bridge, you know, get up that scale of trust in order to get people to, to have those uh, messages really resonate with their customers. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where I go back to our original podcast where we talked about trust and privacy. There are ways to build that trust, to make more transparency there. And it is a delicate balance. But the ability to follow through with your commitments to be much more transparent, the ability to have a consent-based platform where consumers can have the right to delete their actual digital identity, the ability to make that more empowering, to give back control to the consumer to make these changes is another way that we can um, make investments in more of a self-service nature and a platform from this standpoint. So so there's ways that we can really uh, change for the future and make this more transparent and claw back that trust. 
Uh, it's that matter of, of identifying what that is, transparency, as you said, and then really ensuring that you walk the talk and, and actually do what you say you're going to do. Absolutely. Um, which, you know, core, core business values, but so often we've got the ability to really skip over some of the mechanics just for expediency. But hopefully, um, if you've got the technologies in place to ensure that it's not hard to get the to achieve these ends. It'll be easier for those organizations to actually get there. And this was it, it was a conversation that uh, we just had with Justin Lamb uh, about data security and and the data security pieces. And so much of that really depends on ensuring that you've got the technology in place that makes it easy for people to do the right thing. Absolutely. And I see looking ahead, we will continue to explore the intersection between ESG and CX technologies and how it really is shaping that digital customer journey. Well, it's a key part of, of in success and competitiveness and making this all work. Well, I look forward to seeing the next round of data. Uh, what's coming up next and what should listeners be on the lookout for? From us, uh, we actually are retaking a look at the 2022 data for ESG that will be coming out soon. Um, And we will be doing a lot more as it relates to the macroeconomic impacts of these technologies. Oh, well, great stuff. Uh, Cheryl, thank you for being back on the podcast. Uh, Always a wealth of information and, and especially with something that's important as a lot of these perspectives from the consumer side around ESG. Thank you for inviting me. And that is it for this episode of Next in Tech. Thanks to our audience for staying with us. I hope you'll join us for our next episode where we'll be talking about next stages of data capability uh, and a whole raft of of the sort of the next pieces of, of data management. I hope you'll join us then because there is always something Next in Tech.